Okay, I want to talk about uh, machine learning on the web today, and I gave this talk before in German to the German government, the unemployment office of the German government, so I'm not afraid of you at all, because when you, once you went through that and answered all the questions that came from that crowd, you had no worries at all any longer. It was just like, that is cool, what laptop should I buy? Did you even listen to my talk? But okay, fair enough. Uh, also, when you talk about the dangers of machines taking over, have somebody with a German accent is probably a good idea. <laughs> and I want to cover uh, more or less an introductory talk about this. There's more detailed talks about machine learning and what services we have and how you can use them uh, later on and during the day and interspersed everywhere. We've got good documentation on that. But I find it very fascinating how machine learning and AI is the huge thing right now, but we're not talking about the ethics of it. We're not talking about what it means for the people out there. And I think there's a lot of benefits of what machine learning could do being lost because people are afraid of it or people are misusing it just to get a good thing on their CV at the moment. And the, uh, the frame of mind that I have there is between the, between the Terminator and Star Trek when it comes to machine learning and machines, which both movies from a long time ago, and funnily enough, when you look at them now, a lot of these things have become free. Talking about movies from a long time ago, um, Welcome to Future Decoded, I was really freaking out that down there was this car, that the DeLorean, and it had all the things in there. Even the dates are set to the right things that were in the movie, because that went, goes around social media every two months when it's like, today is the day they predicted it. No, today it is. No, today it is. Just watch the movie and look at it. So, I'm Chris Heilman, I'm Code Poet on Twitter, uh, I'm Christian Heilman at Microsoft.com if you want to have some more questions about these kind of things or you don't have, have enough pictures of kittens and hedgehogs in your life. Uh, that's what I do on Twitter mostly, in, in between fighting the good fight for JavaScript. I'm a technical evangelist, I work mostly on the JavaScript side of things, on the, uh, on the Chakra Core engine, on the, on the Edge browser and on Visual Studio Code. Uh, and I've been web developing for about 20 years for things like Yahoo and I was in Mozilla for four years before I came here and uh, uh, I just wanted to show that the web is still an important thing and it's kind of weird because we're losing a bit of battle right now but I'm going to come back to that. Now with machine learning, artificial intelligence, connected devices, security breaches, privacy and surveillance, there's a roller coaster of technology coming on right now. There's an avalanche of information. Every day there's something new happening. They'll be like, oh my god, I don't know this. I might be out of a job in two minutes if I don't know this. And oh my god, this is terrible. This is not working. Although people told us it's working. And it can be very overwhelming for all of us to go out there. And especially when you see things, for example, I'm not covering this here, but I tried to put it in as well. When you see that DDoS attack from IoT devices, it just baffles me that you get cameras that have a preset password without asking people to ever change it. Just make sure that people make their thing that they buy their own, otherwise it becomes part of a botnet. And when you see that, it was like 1.2 megabit per second uh, DDoS attack, and it's just ridiculous how much connectivity is out there. And then when I try to watch Netflix, it buffers all the time, you know? <laughs> it's like, it might be that we're using the things the wrong way. So what does the future hold? We always try to get like my crystal ball out or my tea leaves. There's no emoji for a pop of teacup. We should really change that. Um, and people always ask me this. People always ask me, like, as soon as you start talking, they're like, what, what does the future bring? And I'm like, well, if I knew, I probably would play lotto and not sit here, you know, and make, make, make money somewhere differently. But there's, there's interesting sides to behold. On one side, machine learning and artificial intelligence makes people feel like the Terminator kind of thing, you know, like there's constant machine, machine surveillance, our machines spy on us, take our information, somebody is listening, and we hear these horror stories, there was a hotel chain in America that bought really cheap irons, you know, for ironing your clothes, for the non-developers here, people do that, <laughs> and uh, they got them for like three dollars a piece. And they were like, this is cool, this is a bargain. And then like, uh, a security researcher took the, uh, went to that hotel and realized all of them had a Wi-Fi sniffer chip in them and recorded the data of the rooms for like three months. These kind of things happen and these kind of things scare us and we wonder like, what's going on there? It's uh, smart machines, smart, um, smart water bottles I saw the other day and I'm like, what the? You know? <laughs> it's kind of like, when my genes are connected with me on Twitter and I go online and I buy other genes, will they then start tweeting me like, hey Chris, do do we have to talk about something? Are you, are you not happy with me anymore? You know, this constant surveillance is a thing that people are worried about. 
Replacement of humans with cheaper, unfeeling machines. This was the big thing when I talked to the government about unemployment numbers. They're like, oh my god, we're all going to be replaced by robots because they can work 24-7 and they don't complain about things. And then it's, of course, the robot takeover and the end of humankind unless we find a savior to kill them by making them get into a logic loop. I always liked that in the original Star Trek series. Every time they had a killer robot, uh, sooner or later, uh, uh, Kirk came up with a smug grin and said, like, but you're flawed. So you have to kill yourself. And they always did. You're like, this is a very simple algorithm to put into a machine not to kill itself when somebody says you're flawed. It just can start arguing instead, and that's when machine learning comes in. On the other side, we have Star Trek, of course, which is like ubiquitous computing as a resource to call on human decisions. In Star Trek, in, in the newer versions, you never see them typing anything in. They just say, like, computer, it's like, should I kill this human? Should I kiss that alien? What I should? What should I do? The computer is always there. It's always helping. It's always recording. And it's not recording in an evil manner. It's just like the secretary in the corner that does things for you. And machines taking on human tasks that are dangerous and get us sick in the long run. And this is what machine, uh, what the artificial intelligence and the fourth revolution is more or less about. Machines improving humans to work around shortcomings like. Uh, uh, him here is the best example with his glasses and uh, whenever they needed some extra information that the, the computer could go there and tell it to them or they needed to regrow an arm like in Star, in Star Wars. And a change of values, knowledge instead of monetary goals and that's the thing where we miss out. We, we, we're almost on the level of Star Trek by now but we didn't go for that social level. Uh, Gene Roddenberry, who wrote Star Trek, was a massive humanist. He basically really, really believed in humans, and he believed that humans want to be good, and that money is not important, but actually believing in people and supporting them and teaching each other is much more important. He was the nightmare of the screenwriters, because in uh, Next Generation, he didn't want any conflict. He just said, like, oh, these people are all happy, and they are all just want to gain knowledge, and, uh, and there's, no, there's no drama there. There's nothing you can write about. It's like, oh, they're arguing again. No, they're not arguing because they're agreeing. So let's agree for 40 minutes. It's like the first 20 minutes of episode one. We you know where they get, like, the, 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 the Jedi in to do, like, trade agreements. What? What are you doing there? So machine learning and AI are incredibly hot topics, and people are worried. So right now, if you go to a VC meeting or any startup meeting and you say machine learning, you go into L and then VC people will give you money already. And you're just like, machine, I don't, machine learning is interesting, I didn't, don't do anything, here's money, do something cool with it. So it does a lot of hype around it. And there's weird, weird stuff. I love when, whenever the press does something, it shows the most coolest thing. So one of them is expensive, creepy parrots, when you got these uncanny valley human machines. I love this one. Let's take a look at that quickly. They will play with us. They will teach us. They will help us put the groceries away. I think that the artificial intelligence will evolve to the point where they will truly be our friends. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay. I will destroy humans. <laughs> no, I took it back. Don't destroy humans. <laughs> This is a human expression, according to that guy. I mean, what kind, of, what kind of people is he surrounded with? That's what fascinates me the most there. It's like, why would we want to make something? I always hate that in science fiction movies when you've got a killer robot and they always kill him by ripping something out of the back there, like you would kill a human. You know, if I made a killer robot, I would everything in the armor plating here so you can't reach it. Why would I build something with the same flaws as humans? Because it will always be creepy. It will always be wrong like this. And you can so you see that the movement is quite okay, but she just repeats like a parrot what he said. Okay, let's destroy humans. Maybe there should have been a filter in there. Destroying humans is not a thing you should be doing. And the other thing, of course, is military research. A lot of machine learning came from military research. They were the only ones that had the foresight to put lots of money into it. And this is Boston Dynamics. Every time they bring up one of these self-driving or self-walking robots, they kick it. <laughs> You know, if the robot takeover happens, that is because they remember that. And we're even stupid enough to film it and put it on YouTube so they can actually prove it at robot court against us once we actually have to prove that humans are worth something. But it's, it's kind of like, this, these are always cool to see, but then I just see the, the uh, they were just there to bring explosives into, into other humans and kill them. That's the thing I don't like about them. It's weird that they got bought by, by, by Google and then sold by Google again. I don't know what's happened there, but... They do some really interesting stuff. One of them was uh, opening a door the other day. That was quite scary as well, like when the robot stands on top of you in the middle of the night and you don't know why. 
I think it's time for us as developers to show that machine learning is not something of the future, but something that humans can benefit from now. And we, we do that because we're not afraid of it. We actually live and breathe technology and we're actually, we're actually almost bored by it. And just when I saw the keynote earlier or I saw the Google keynote earlier this year as well at Google I.O., I see all these solutions of very, very successful people who have like minor inconveniences in their life and then buy $600 hardware to get these minor inconveniences out of the way. Like, oh my God, what's the weather like? If only I knew. You have a condo, open the window. Look out, you know, this is what you can do. But we always like, it should be easier, so let's find a hardware and some software with it. The future of computing needs first and foremost people who are not afraid. And I'm not afraid to try new things out. I'm not afraid that my JavaScript knowledge from 10 years ago is not interesting anymore on a CV. Because I moved on, I, I, I realized I have to do more things. I have to be open to new information all the time. The reason is that my first computer wasn't able to do much. It's still the best computer on this planet, and whoever used an, uh, an Acorn or used a, 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 a Sinclair is not right. The Commodore 64 was still the best computer out there, and it didn't do much. So I basically I had to learn everything by myself. In the beginning, I didn't even have anything to store something on, so I wrote the same game or the same graphics program to, to paint something every single day. And when I turned it off, it was gone. And next day I wrote it slightly better, slightly shorter, slightly more. And this is the cool thing about those machines because they weren't, they weren't intrusive. They weren't like, I know more than you do. You were just standing there like, yeah, I, t I type in things. You do stuff for me. And not like, oh, please sign in with your credit card and these 6,000 things and a bit of pint of blood and your firstborn before you can, uh, can download a movie with DRM in it that we have nowadays. This taught me not to be afraid of machines. Machines are nothing more to me than something that makes my life easier. I was curious and interested about them, and it made me always look under the hood and see what I could use them for. I haven't done any math homework in school. I always wrote a program for that myself, and then wrote it by hand, the results of it, and then donated the program to my school library. That's how I got a math well, high school degree, and then I stopped with school because I didn't like it, or couldn't afford going to university. Computers are shovels to me. I don't have any personal relationship to a shovel. That would be weird. And I basically just see it as something to dig a hole with or to get out of my house if I'm in Scotland in the winter. And we shouldn't make computers this religion or this amazing thing. That's why I hate messaging when it says, like, it's magic. This thing magically solves all the problems to you, which makes it, you're an idiot. You will not understand it anyways. So here's some $500 upgrade because you obviously don't know how to change a battery yourself or something like that. It just drives me crazy that computers have become from these helper tools to consumerist, uh, like things that I cannot do anything with except for going to a genius and tell him what's, what's what. Now, everybody talks about the fourth industrial revolution, and I want to... I want to talk about it a bit as well because it's interesting that for, for the first time what I do as a computer developer kind of big thing and the main market is talking to each other and they're like, dude, the guys, the things that you've been doing 30 years in the basement, like we need this now, what do I need to know now? That's how the, the unemployment agency of Germany came up to me for some reason. I'm like, okay, I can talk to you. So the first industrial revolution was the steam engine. That one made sure that we actually can produce things faster. Train, uh, we had trains. We had all kind of like autom automotives already. It was easier to get from the countryside into the city and actually start working there. And it also made it easier to produce things much faster than doing it by hand. The next one was then electricity, where we had the telephone. And that one made us communicate better, that was talked to over, over countries, over uh, in, the whole, in the whole country. We were able to communicate with people without going somewhere, and this was pretty amazing. And electricity, of course, uh, gave us light, gave us warmth, all the things that we have in the, in the Markov pyramid were covered out of a sudden, and it's really, really nice that we have electricity. Um, if you want to see something really cool about like, electricity, uh, there is a, a documentary on YouTube called uh, The Light Bulb Conspiracy. It's about inbuilt obsolescence of light bulbs. There's a light bulb in America that's been burning since 1905. And that was not uncommon. They made light bulbs burn out after 10,000 hours. So they have something to put on their advertising and saying like lasts for 10,000 hours. Because lasts forever is shit advertising because nobody will buy a new one anyway. So it's a very, very interesting one. The third one then was the computer. This is how they looked, how they looked like. It's a very, very 
portable thing, very beautiful. I think it's the size of my flat in London. It's probably cheaper than my flat in London, but that's a different story. And computers made everything much more automated. Boring tasks that humans should not do, like repetitive for loops, if conditions that are very simple, computers could do for us. Trajectories of, uh, um, of, of moon landing crafts, all kind of really cool things. And each industrial revolution, of course, meant that people lost their job. When you can automate something in a machine, you don't need as many people who are doing it by hand any longer. When you got electricity, you don't need anybody who feeds the horses any longer. At one time, it was there was there was like headlines in the newspapers in America that said because of horses are not being used any longer, the whole uh, the whole farm belt will collapse because most of what they did was horse food, not human food, but horse food back then because humans used horses. At the same time, the quality of life improved. Warmth, electricity, light, these kind of things, not, uh, uh, not, being, not being able to work, uh, uh, not having to force to work somewhere at home, but going to the city and getting a better paid job. I always find it fascinating when people cry about the old good times, like make America great again is one of those things, you know, where it's like childhood is about 60 years old. The concept of childhood. Before that, when you were 12, 13, and you were living on a farm, you had to go and feed the chickens. You had to go out in the morning and, and talk to the horses or whatever farmers do. But uh, the, the whole, like, oh, we, it was so much easier to be children back then. That's a lie. It was just, we, we romanticized it with movies and with books. But in reality, the, the, uh, the right to be a child has just become, since we had more free time, because our jobs were much more optimized. And we had time to look after our children and to deal with our children. And nowadays we spend it on like binge watching Netflix, but that's another story. The problem is that it's not for all. And this is where the main problem starts. Like where the industrial revolution made a few people really, really rich and a, few, and a lot of, lot of workers really, really sick. And, not much, and they didn't get much money for it and they didn't have a proper health plan until unions came around and made that work as well. So what we call success these days turns out to be more and more of a scam. Uh, making money by all means doesn't help humanity, the market or the environment, and we only have one planet to live on for now. The whole growth, 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 innovate, 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 I'm just getting very tired of this. I'm just, why don't we take what we have right now and make humankind better? So this is me being the, the, the techno hippie and saying like, hey, how about we take the money we can save from machine learning and put it into a citizen's wage, for example. So people can do the job that they're good at rather than having to have a job to survive. It's 2016, we should be at that level on a social level, but this is what we're going to talk about here. But I think we, at the, at the forefront of this, we as developers, have a great opportunity here to define this fourth revolution, because economists are talking about it wide and far. I mean, I read eight books that didn't make any sense to me, but I saw every time in there like, hey, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. We should be there to actually bring our knowledge to bring, make people better and make our companies better as well. We're in a lucky position where our jobs are secure and we control what's happening. For now, this might change as well. But I mean, I get like LinkedIn offers every, every two or three days that I don't want. And when I go on, on Christmas, I see my family who are all coal miners or factory workers. My, my godfather is now 52 and just got unemployed because his company went bankrupt. He doesn't even need to go to the Dole office anymore. That's not going to be anything for him. He's just going to be on the Dole for the rest of his life because there's no jobs out there. So there's a great website on the BBC based on a Oxford Martin, uh, Oxford uh, University research where you can type in your job and it tells you what the likelihood of you being replaced by a computer is going to be. It's a cheerful afternoon thing to do, of course. Uh, but I find it very fascinating that the most of the interesting jobs that you think should be safe or should be different uh, actually taste quite nicely. So IT project and program managers, like, like, like I am, according to paper, uh, there's a 22% likeliness that I can be completely com replaced by a script or machine, le machine learning my, my job. So that's kind of okay still. I'm actually not too worried about this because I could always go back to goat farming or something like that if I wanted to. Uh, legal secretaries that you would think is something that is so non-understandable for us humans. I don't know legal texts. It's like, why are they all uppercase? That's my main problem always with them, like terms and conditions. When you scroll through them and you're like, oh, what's going on there? I love a startup in London that had uh, in their terms and conditions in the middle somewhere, it said, if you can find this, uh, email us, we give you £2,000. It took people two years to find it. 
nobody reads terms and conditions, they just scroll through them. But uh, a lot of work in legal companies, in solicitor offices and uh, these kind of things, is basically just looking at other court cases, looking at the outcome of other documents and finding patterns in them. And this is what computers are great at and what legal secretaries are bored with and actually have a problem with. That's why it's so easy to replace them. However, company secretaries, the people that deal with uh, HR stuff, that deal with human problems, that deal with who to hire, these are not replaceable by computers as fast because computers don't have any empathy. That's the biggest issue with automating everything, that computers don't know what to do in a, in a moral dilemma. MIT has this website right now where you can vote what a machine, uh, what a self-driving car should run over. If it's going to be the old woman or the two children or the like. Uh, they didn't put any race in there. That would be interesting, these numbers right now. But I find, it, I find it very fascinating that this is one of the biggest problems that we have with machines that are thinking. Um, um, iRobot, the movie, uh, had a really good moment there where, it's, where it said that these three laws of robotics, that a, that a robot cannot harm a human, a robot cannot harm himself un, uh, uh, unless the human uh, is the other one, and so on and so forth. It shows that sooner or later robots will protect us from ourselves because we're the only ones stupid enough to harm each other. But it's, we need these, these problems answered right now. And I'm looking forward to what's going on there. So robots and intelligent systems will take jobs away from us. That is not an if, it's a when. And it's sooner than we think. This is happening right now. And it's good, it's okay. It's called evolution, it's called going further. There's a lot of jobs out there that people are in that makes them sick mentally and physically and they're not happy doing them. And the amount of money we spend getting these people with their acts, what they do to society, or with getting them okay again or sending them on sabbaticals for half a year so they stop shouting at people in the office, we're losing money that way as well. So there's a, there's a, a grade of how safe your job is. It's basically going from numbers and routine you're done. This is you, your job is already done by a computer, most likely. Uh, um, Associated Press writes a lot of their their daily news, like the weather news and these kind of things, by machines. There's no human in uh, in there anymore. Uh, Facebook tried that as well. They sacked all the editorial staff and then made auto-generated news articles. They were all rubbish, so they actually had to hire them again because the machine wasn't quite as far as they thought it was. Yeah, so it goes from numbers, words, images, working with humans, abstract thinking, and from routine to variety. So if you do abstract thinking and variety, you're okay, which is to me development. We, we're not there to write algorithms for other algorithms. We're there to find the right algorithm to do a certain task. And we're quite okay so far. I mean, there is code being written by itself as well. And the more uh, uh, formulaic your code becomes, the more easy it is to, to change it as well. So the fourth revolution that we're talking about, and uh, Microsoft has quite some very, very good keynotes on that, is from the steam engine to electricity to computer to digital, physical, and biological symbiosis. Computers turn into us, we turn into computers. Our data is what fuels those machines, and those machines are there for us. Virtual reality, augmented reality, just chatbots talking to each other is a human-computer interaction we didn't have before. Personally, I'm, I have a really hard time with virtual, virtual reality. I love augmented reality. HoloLens is quite fun. I mean, the price is a bit steep. But uh, uh, it's, it's, I, I like changing the world around me with computers. I don't like going into a 3D world uh, because I've seen it fail so many times. And if the frame rate isn't right enough, I get travel sick in them. So this is a very big problem for me to get excited about something that makes me puke after two minutes. But that's something that's my personal problem. But it's, there's a great opportunity in VR as well. It feels a lot like science fiction, and it is to a degree. Let's take a look what science fiction, uh, what science fiction, the future was in 1999. Where's the park? I saw that I scored his number. He wasn't there. This was so cool. I mean, I, was, I always had to, I always had to go away and, and, and watch Star Trek on the sly because my parents hated science fiction. I like American crap. I'm not gonna watch that. But I'm just like, this is cool. I want this. This is amazing. And then you analyze it and you see like, 
you you really lifts we have those we, we kind of have those by now that's quite fine so Americans call them elevators but they're there and uh, it's quite fun in Heathrow I'm gonna come back to it later when there's no button in a lift people just freak out it's uh, uh, most of them are called these dummy buttons or uh, uh, what are they called uh, doesn't matter Basically, the buttons don't do anything, but it gives people the control. I'm doing something. I'm in control. This thing is not just moving up and down without me being interactive with it. It's great when you put a button there and people all of a sudden like, I'm totally fine now. Tablet computers. I mean, I was like, ah, computers never going to be that small. This is going to be ridiculous. And then we got these like, it, it's fun how phones become bigger again. I was really excited when we had the four inch factor in between them. Like, this is really cool for my pocket. And all of a sudden, it's like, thing in my pocket again like but I use it for everything it's pretty amazing even if I have to reboot it every two days great um, server synchronization like nothing ever in Star Trek gets lost you know they're not like oh my god you forgot the floppy disk or it's scratched now we cannot find the next planet they have like the databases that talk to each other and, and sync with each other and it's the same with me like nowadays I don't trust computers anymore these things break and like people spill things on them so I put everything on my personal cloud on different cloud services and as an open source person I just put everything out there so if I get hit by a bus fine you go on with it you do it I share it with you as well Language recognition, computer location of return in Barclay. Of course, nobody used computer because that would be rather stupid. So instead, we use OK Google, Alexa, Siri, Cortana. We have like different keywords for different systems. I always want to have a house full of those. So and then I'm like, so hey, where's the best restaurant in the area? And let's just sit there for 20 minutes with Cortana and Siri arguing with each other and getting all catty <laughs> about it. That would be so much fun. Finding people, Lieutenant Barkley is on Holodeck 3. I mean, we can do that now. These things tell us all the time where we are. Friends in your area, it's always a bit creepy, but it's there. We have these technologies already. Nowadays, we have these supercomputers in our pockets, and we're always complaining about them. It's quite fun how much, how much time we spend on something that is like, it's not magical, you know, I, I was promised all these things and it's not working now. Like, at the same time, you're like, you know, it goes to space for you and comes back and pinpoints you on the planet and tries to talk to 12 different broken mobile masts while you're doing this. Connectivity is not fun, but every time we, we have a problem with a phone, it's much more annoying. In user tests, it's great when you do website testing. People are happy to wait 20 seconds on a, uh, on a desktop. On 20 seconds on a mobile phone, they just want to slap you and just basically give up and start becoming KKK members or something. Mobile computing is constantly on the rise. It has, been take, it has taken over uh, desktop computing for quite a while because, of course, they're much, more, uh, they're much cheaper, they're much easier to carry around, they, they actually come with you, they're much more personal. And in the places where growth is happening, Africa, Indonesia, uh, India, Desktop computers don't make any sense because there is no wired connectivity. There's no wires on the ground, but there's mobile masts everywhere. So the next billion users will be on mobile devices. They won't be on desktop devices. So we have to think about that as web developers. It means that the interaction between human and machine changed drastically. What we, what we had before is now completely different. We had keyboard and mouse. Nowadays, we've got camera, speaker, microphone, device movement, and even body functions with IoT devices and like trackers and these kind of things. You, we have all this input that we have to deal with somehow. From text and images, sound and video as content, we now have speech recognition, speech synthesis, vibration of not the voice, but actually the phone itself. We have notifications, we have movements, we have uh, notifications from, from wrists moving. All this data is coming in. Instead of clicking and typing, people touch things, they move, they get closer, they ask questions and they show emotions. Emotion detection is a very, very cool thing to do things with. I, love, I worked on the machine learning APIs and when we were like, smile to continue and, and finding different emotions, working with Finnish people, impossible. But uh, with, uh, with Americans and with English people, it's actually fun how much more nicer the team was, to, was with each other when we tested emotions on the computer because we, 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 didn't, we didn't worry about showing emotions anymore like we do all the time as an English person especially. All this generates an amazing amount of data and it's not simple to parse format and that time's very erratic. So a lot of this stuff comes in and if you ever had to work with NFC or USB, there's lots of data coming in in formats that you're like, I have no idea what's going on here. So we needed to find a way to get computers to understand humans better. And we did that by 
Mailing will learn from patterns, find patterns in, uh, in data, so we don't have to clean up the data ourselves, but the computers should do it for us. In the fourth industrial revolution, information is oil. This is really what people are paying with. Uh, uh, that's why Facebook, uh, Google, Microsoft and others, we are on the forefront of this because we have data, we have information and we connected that over the years and now is the time where all of these companies are opening up and giving back the APIs to us as developers to do something with that data that we recorded and not just randomly recorded to show you better ads next to it, which never works. Computers are great to churn through large sets of data and find patterns without getting bored and without make, becoming erratic. Humans are crap at that. If you, get, if you get a repetitive task to do over and over again, after the sixth, seventh iteration, you start making mistakes because you're bored. You don't want to do it. Computers don't get bored. They're like, oh, same data again. That's great. Let me do some more of that same data. That's lovely. I know how to do that now. The more data we give to machines, the better the results will be. And that's why something like Facebook's uh, image recognition is much better than a startup that has like 50 pictures of people. Our job right now is to create mobile interfaces that are simple, human, and fun to use. And this is a hard task with web technology, but we're there, we're getting there. And I'm very proud of having worked on Firefox OS, although it was a massive failure in terms of like a commercial success. But a lot of the APIs that we pushed forward are now in all the browsers out there for us to use as well. But let's acknowledge the elephant in the room first. We saw it earlier in the keynote that business and hype is all about chatbots and personal assistants. We've got Siri, Google Now, Cortana, Alexa, and Facebook. Nobody talks about M, but it's really clever. It's a really, really amazing thing that they did. And of course, TechCrunch and others say like, okay, uh, chatting is the new platform. Uh, OS is not a platform anymore. The web is not a platform anymore. Everybody is using bots for everything. And to a degree, it, it, it's true. The numbers show that people don't download any apps anymore, but actually are okay to use messenger bots and talk to messenger bots. This might be a novelty factor, though. This might be because it's easier right now. The same way people downloaded hundreds of apps and then basically deleted them after not using them for eight months. People now connect to lots of chatbots, and I'm like, hey, every time I eat a pizza, I know I have the chatbot now. And you're like, and you realize you, you use it eight times a year or something. Why do I have to have this in my in my contact list and talk to other contacts on my behalf as well? People do banking with chatbots. People do dispatching, like ordering things with bad chatbots. People uh, do research with chatbots. I mean, if you have to need a chatbot to ask him who is Donald Trump, you have another issue. But people do it, it seems. Fashion statements, like here's a picture of me. What kind of what kind of what kind of T-shirt can you offer me that looks good on me? Kind of stuff. Uh, personal tracking, health, sports, study, and so on and so forth. This is a Chinese app that's massively in use. And it's quite fun how you can have this very funny cartoony style in China and everybody uses it like normal. It's not for kids, it's for everybody. It's quite amazing how people there are much, uh, are much more uh, okay to chat with something because the internet is censored and very, very uh, small. And then wallet, money transfers, these kind of things. We all being at a call center uh, uh, phone line and it's like, why can't I just say I have this much and I want this much? So these systems are out there and are being used. If you want to play with bots, uh, we got your back. My colleague Rita Zhang uh, did a really nice little introductory uh, uh, chatbot that uses memes. In case you, you are socially awkward and you don't want to use words, you can just say like, okay, a success kit, this bot is cool. And then that's now in Slack. And now it gives you a picture of a bot. By, uh, the, the picture is generated by the bot for you. And she has the code of that. It's a few lines of JavaScript and uh, just an Azure instance to get the images generated for you. So these things are really easy to build and the bot network that Microsoft has and Skype has and Facebook has and Google has and everybody has a bot network right now, all of them are basically messaging services back and forth, which is pretty cool to write interesting things, but not everything has to become a bot. More traditional interfaces like fat client and web need more intelligent and simple interfaces too. That's why when I'm, getting, I'm very excited about how simple these bots are and then I go back to like a desktop that I have to use that has been done in like SharePoint six years ago and I just basically want to crawl under my desk and not look at that thing ever again. It's like, why is it five steps where it could be one button? So let's think about what we can automate and what we can make better in our interfaces using these technologies in traditional interfaces. 
Machine learning is everywhere. This is in Heathrow. There are no call buttons. The lift will stop automatically. And still people look for the button and keep pressing them. And they think it doesn't make a difference, but people are just scared about this. Things should happen in the background. You should not be told that they happen automatically. It should become better for you the more you use it or the more the system knows of you. One great example is image resizing. Uh, when, I, when I have an upload, you see the one on, with the red arrow here. This is a stupid uh, resized image of that original image because it wasted half the pixels on nothing that makes any sense. And the more smaller you get, the less you would know what the hell it is. It might be a fire and not a lady in these fiery colors. The middle one is a bit better because what it did there is automatically detect the face and center the cropping around the face of the lady. The third one is even better because it just found the outline of the lady and made that one into the thumbnail. These things we had to do in Photoshop, these things we had to do in Illustrator and all kinds of other systems, nowadays computers do that for us. There are smart crop JS even in JavaScript on the client side, please don't, but you can do that. What it basically does, it, does a, a, it changes it to grayscale and then finds the outlines and gives you the outlines that way. There's a great service called imagex.com which does that as well. It does, it does a high contrast version of your image and then crops it around that high contrast section. That's not really machine learning. It's still on a pixel level, the same way the first one was just on a pixel level. Cloudinary are a, a service from Israel that use a lot of our services and Azure, uh, and Azure to give you all kind of cool stuff to resize images. So it has a REST API where you can say like, give me this image, uh, but actually the 16 by 9 ratio, center it on the face of the person in it, and then turn it 35, 45 degrees and put a watermark on it and these kind of things. So instead of having to do all of that in your machine before you upload it, you can do it on the demand and then cache it for the next user who has the same URL so you don't show that picture over and over again. But it's amazingly powerful what you can do with images there. Now, Google's, uh, uh, Google's photo service is, uh, is very silent about it, but it has a lot of great machine learning in it. This is my uh, image stream, and I did a video to make sure I don't show anything uh, embarrassing. But you got like selfies, for example. I never tagged something as a selfie, but it knows what I look like, and it knows what photos where I look directly into the camera at a certain angle, and then it says like these are all the selfies that you took of yourself, which is kind of embarrassing. But we have them. The same way uh, when it comes to locations, Tel Aviv. I was in Tel Aviv, and of course there's the, the geolocation that the photo is that my camera puts on it. But you can see there's Heathrow pictures in there. This is on the way to Tel Aviv. So by the tweets that I wrote about it saying like on the way to Tel Aviv, it realized this is, a, this is part of the Tel Aviv thing. Then I can type a, a dog in German. I never tagged anything in German. The same with cat Katze in German. It shows our family dog, but that's because he's confused. Uh, but. I never typed these things in, but it found the cat, it found the dog in other languages, and I didn't have to tag them to make them findable, and that's pretty amazing. Food, it says like food, and it finds like the sushi that I had, and like food cans as well, and chips and these kind of things. And then when I say like veg mats, which is a very, very human thing, it doesn't find anything. So Facebook does the same. There's alternative text on images if you don't put alternative text on them. And alternative text is very, very important. I do a lot of uh, accessibility work and blind people cannot see your photos. Put something in there that makes sense. So it says that image may contain dog, outdoor and nature. Where does that come from? Where is that happening? Well, Facebook for years has been analyzing images and comparing them with data sets and putting images in there and having humans type in Image, uh, image data. That was Amazon's Mechanical Turk has been used for that one a lot in the past. And we have full data sets. So we, we classify different parts of an image, we detect the parts of the image, and then we segment them out into own images and own image data sets. And they do that with everything, with animals, with buses, with whatever. There's a great uh, blog post about that explaining in detail how that works. And then you get data sets that you can use for that. There's a few open ones. ImageNet.org used to be one that was around for quite a while that has tagged images that you can use to throw your learning engine against and say, like, compare it with those and define the images that we have in here. Uh, Google just realized image, uh, ImageNet.org, which is the open images data set, 
And that one is 654 megabyte of URLs and metadata. These are not the images. This is just the text data pointing to the images and telling you what these images are. So you can use those in your systems as an open available server set. It's on GitHub. And it has, for example, here balcony, stairs, facade, iron, interior design, gate architecture. So these are human typed in things. These are humans giving you the context that the machine couldn't have. Cutlery table where a metal spoon, fork, and so on. Uh, they do image captioning in TensorFlow, which is their cloud system, their, their machine learning system. I haven't used it myself yet, but it, uh, it looks very, very powerful what you can do with it. And there you have, for example, three images that have been tagged the same way or described the same way by, uh, by humans. And then the other photo is more or less the same. Okay, probably that's the tagging that you want to have. You can then detect the syntax, mix and match. Once you have a description like that, you can find out what is the nouns, what is the attributes, what's the verbs and then make full sentences out of those, of descriptions of three other photos, to make one human readable sentence out of the other one as well. English is beautiful that way because it's very simple compared to other languages. That's why most of the machine learning demos with voice recognition are always in English. You're like, yay, now let's try it in Finnish and try it in Island Icelandic and go from there. You can add visual information. You find out there's two bears in there. They're, they're brown color, so make them brown. This train has different colors in them, so let's add those colors to it as well to even make it more descriptive for people. And we've got a system called captionbot.ai, which does the same thing, a uh, demo, where you can type something in and it finds out, okay, here's a young man jumping on a skateboard. This is all part of the cognitive services. There's a demo booth down uh, at, the, at the expo as well. Uh, so what this one does is you upload a photo and it finds humans in it and it finds descriptions for it. So this one realizes this is a man in water, people swimming, and these are all tags. These are not, uh, these are not sentences yet. So the caption bot takes another service called Lewis to put them into sentences afterwards. It also realizes what is uh, uh, the, the images, uh, the colors in those photos. So if you want to do a preloader that shows the right color before you replace it, you can use that system for it. It also detects racy content and adult content, so in case you need to filter that out, which you probably should, then you can use this system for it. And uh, an aside, we have a service together with other companies and Interpol that automatically detects child pornography in pictures and automatically deletes them. So if you have a service where people can upload all kind of crap, use that service to make sure that you're actually legal with your system and make sure that these people get caught. Because uh, we can only fight that together as well. And it's not fun watching these things as a human. A computer detecting that it is a picture like that and automatically deleting it is a much better way of dealing with that. We got facial recognition. Uh, the facial recognition gives you the, uh, uh, the, the points where the eyes are, where the nose are, where the mouth is. It gives you also the angle of the face and if it's tilted in one of these three directions. This is also being used in, uh, in, uh, in Windows Hello if you unlock your Surface Book, for example, by looking into it. This is the same data set and the same systems. We use this, for example, to paint moustaches on people and other things. And, of course, you can also use it to detect uh, emotions then. Because depending on how the parts of your parts of your face change means emotions like being scared is bigger eyes, being happy is bigger mouth, and so on and so forth. So you, there's another demo down at the expo that you can play with that, but it gives you uh, these five emotions: anger, contempt, disgust, fear, happiness, neutral, sadness, surprise. Basically everything by watching the news every morning. But it gives you like a one to zero uh, how much part of that that face is. So you can detect the face and you get the data set back as JSON. You can then verify the face because each face gets an ID. So once you have it in your data set, you can compare it with others. That's tag your friends automatically on Facebook. That's exactly how that works and exactly how you could run it over a data set in your company, for example. Then you can cluster them automatically. You say like you have elderly people, you've got women, you've got kids, you've got smiling women, you've got uh, angry, ang angry Turkish people, you've got uh, confused Germans, all kind of things. You can automatically cluster those images into your, into your databases, which is pretty cool. What I saw yesterday for the first time, I didn't know we do that yet, we also have with video now. You can stabilize shaky videos. I've done that already with like drone footage that is always... And we showed that six years ago, I think, the first time that we stabilized video for you now. And that one is something that is really, really cool to make your videos much easier to understand. You can detect and track faces in video. You can detect motion in video, which is which one is, uh, is, is still, which one is the motion. 
And what that one did here is just basically generated thumbnails every few seconds and then ran the thumbnails through the uh, analysis tool to get those tags from it. So we have a video now overlaying with what's happening in the video by analyzing different thumbnails of it. Machines and code to me are there to help humans communicate better. The more useful our intelligent solutions are for human, the easier it will, be, it will be for people to stop fearing innovation, to stop being afraid of machine learning and, uh, and losing their job and so on and so forth. Fear of innovation in many cases shows itself by making sure the first use of an intelligent system leads to a failure. We love to show our supremacy over technology. Every time you show somebody Siri or you show somebody Cortana, they ask it something it doesn't know. And it makes us feel good. You know, it's like, oh, wow, I'm independent, I'm, I'm more clever than this cool computer thing, you know. It's kind of like, yeah, you basically shot, shot yourself in the foot, you know, like, I can, I can show I'm not caring about nature by running around naked as well, but I will get a cold. So it's, it, you didn't gain anything, but we love it. Like when a, when a self-driving car drives into a ditch, it's the end of that innovation. Look, it's not working. When like 50,000 people get killed every day by drunk drivers, well, that just happens, you know? It's like when computers make a mistake, we love that and we talk about it a lot. In the worst case, it's flat out trolling and sabotage and the press loves when that happens. Uh, you may have realized the Tay.bot that we had that we put on the internet and said like, it's like a teenage girl, talk to it and it basically, uh, it basically learns from what humans are like. That it was a teenage girl from the beginning, I don't, wasn't part of that. But uh, I was just standing there fascinating. Within 24 hours, the machine learned to be racist and to quote Hitler and all kind of cool stuff. Because somebody played that thing. It's okay, we could have had put more safeguards in there, but we did it as a social experiment. We said, like, okay, let's throw this thing out and see what people do with it. And the few people with too much time on their, on their hands, sitting in their mother's basement with a fast connection, were basically playing that thing like, <laughs> let's make it say Hitler things. You're like, really? So what's the winning argument here? Tay has been running in China for a few months and has been very successful mimicking or communicating on a very human level with people. But in the Western world, we just love to mess with these things and say like, okay, let's break it. <laughs> Look, computers are stupid, I'm clever. It really, it doesn't help anybody right now. But it's, uh, it was a technical success. It exactly learned what Twitter is about right now and that is racism and quoting Hitler. And it's not fun that we live in this world where something as beautiful as an open system like Twitter where I can voice my opinions is being played by a small group of people who want to kill things. Quality is dependent on data and context. There's a great service called Chris, uh, Custom Recognition Intelligence Service. And that one, we interviewed kids uh, three to five years old about their favorite books and then rubbish came out when we turned it into like uh, voice to text. But then we taught the system that it was about books and out of a sudden the, the nonsense text on the left hand side turned into the text on the right hand side. So giving a machine the data and the context means good things come out of it. Get inspired by the amazing stuff that is already happening and create more human solutions. Think about the human aspect of that, not about like how much we can automate. There's a great video, we're not going to show it right now, you probably have seen it, if you haven't seen it, please do, that's Saki, a friend of mine here from London, he's blind, he has smart glasses, and he put an app, he wrote an app on it that uses these image recognition things to tell him what's happening around him. To take pictures of like, hey, here's the train station, to take, uh, take pictures in meetings, there's two, two people next to you, a woman that's asleep, a man that's angry, it does OCR scanning of menus for him, so he can read menus, although he can't see. And that's exactly what Star Trek is about. There's live translation of calls. Skype does live translation of like speaking into it in English and then converting it into Swedish so the person on the other side hears it in Swedish. And it's good quality, it's not insulting people randomly like most other translation services did in the past. Uh, the, the easy learning tools inside OneNote are really amazing as well. They, they change uh, the reading mode according to people's dyslexic problems or, or, uh, or, uh, or mental issues. So people learn much faster by getting their text just slightly displayed differently. We have a company in Sweden that we worked with that did a retina scanning of, of kids while they were reading on a screen. 
and by the delay of their pupils, they actually realized what kind of learn reading disability or reading problems these kids have and changed the interface accordingly so kids could learn much better. This is cool. This is what machines, to me, are supposed to do. Adding automated content in context, this is the new chat system by Google called Allo. And then when you upload a picture and it gives you like, mm, yum linguini, or I love Italian food. It doesn't even say noodles, pasta, these kind of things. It gives you context from the image. I'm kind of freaked out by that because I don't know anymore when I'm going to talk to a computer or talk to another human through a computer. So if you get like three sentences to send back to your friends, why do you even use the, the friend any longer? It's like we humans become a transportation system for computers to talk to each other. It's up to us to make this revolution one that improves all mankind and not only to make some quick money and show us more ads because that system is broken. We have to do something about this. We have, to, we have now the freedom to get paid for the things that we love doing. So let's give some love to, back to humanity because humans are great people. Dogs are better people, but humans are great people too. And there's no need to make them do things they're not meant to do. And let's, forget, let's not forget, when the first lift came out, there was always a lift assistant standing in there. And let's look at the face of that woman, how happy she is with her job. So let's not build that. Let's make computers that help humans. Thanks very much.